hydrogen cycle. Um, so. Okay, so I don't know if you guys noticed I ran it. I didn't see anything about the body in my output, right? It's because I forgot to put it and to, to tell my car that, hey, you have a body. So now if I run it, see, there we go. So this is a four-door sedan, sedan, front level, the different wheels, the engine, and the car make. Okay, so let's look at what we had to do there. So we created a new class. We had to create a visit method in our car element visitor to deal with that new class. We had to then, um, that body class, we had to make sure that it, it inherited from car element and implemented that accept method. And then in our visitor, our print visitor, we had to make sure we dealt with that visit method to print something out, right? So that's, I don't know, what is that, five different things there? Okay. So let's go to F sharp. And let's just go ahead and add body of string. And when I do that, as soon as I enter that in there, I got a squiggly on my pattern, okay? What does that mean? Why did it do that? It says incomplete pattern matches on this expression. For example, the value body may indicate a case may not be covered. So the compiler is telling me that, hey, you didn't deal with all the different cases of this thing, right? So I go, oh, wow. Yeah, let's do that. I definitely want to do that. So, so let's create a case, or a, a pattern for it, I should say. Body, and this would be say print well, what you got was a warning but you could set warnings as errors and make yeah. it yeah which is probably a good idea actually <clears throat> all right so cool so I got that and that's ready and yeah, let's go ahead. You know, I could have the same mistake and I could not put a body in my car here, but let's do that body. Four door. That's good. Let's run on that. So. four-door sedan, okay? That, I think, was a little bit more straightforward than the visitor pattern, right? Mm -hmm. C-sharp version. So I, in fact, I added the new attribute to my type, right? Think of it that way. And then the compiler told me, hey, you need to deal with this, right? And then I just had to make sure that my data had that new thing, right? Now, Here's, here's the interesting part to me. So remember I was saying you got data and it kind of works its way through the program? So when you get to the part where you go on to print out your car, this is the logic for printing out a car. So it's still all in one place, just like it was in the print car print visitor class, right? It was all in the same place. I think this is a little clearer because you don't have all that visit noise and passing in the different types and all that kind of stuff, right? <clears throat> and just kind of compare it from a readability standpoint. Ooh, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> also, if, if you've ever stepped through code like this in the debugger and you go ricocheting around from one object to another uh, in, and, in and out of the visitor, um, you can lose sight of where you are. Right, right. So it's like visit, it's like visit, what's visit have to do with printing, right? I mean, that, that word by itself, like, okay, yeah, we're using the visitor pattern, but still, you know, it's just this kind of, kind of thing. I mean, visit has to be a generic term because the idea is you're going to have multiple things you're going to want to do to this class hierarchy, right? And you're not going to come up with a term that's going to cover everything. Yeah. So I think the other aspect of the visitor is that... Um, very, in, in, a, in a way similar to F-sharp's discriminated unions, uh, it is a pattern for adding new operations uh, to an object graph 
without modifying you know that object graph per se and its its structure. So um, you do that in F sharp through adding different functions, but uh, I, mean, I, I think it's still a very compelling case that uh, F sharp syntax and type checking basically you know uh, really help you to do the right thing. They get rid of you know uh, they get rid of some of the ways that it's possible to make a mistake in C sharp. It, well, that's precisely right. I mean, the idea of the open close principle, you don't want to be modifying stuff and, and keeping the operations a little bit separate from the data. I, and, and, and the visitor pattern does it this way, F sharp does it using um, discriminated unions. And then, like I was saying, you think of the flow of data through your application, you, you could be doing many different things with a car. So you got a function that's on the disassemble and you pass in a car. All your disassemble logic's right there, and you're probably going to have a pattern match. So you're going to have pattern matches that are going to operate on a car element type, you know, a value of this discriminant union, but it's going to be in context of that application versus having a class, a visitor class, or whatever. And it's it, where, in my head, that the, the class names, the objects that are involved to make those things happen, kind of get in the way of what's really happening, right? So, like I said, you're, you're, it's more data centric in this fashion where the data is flowing to that patient, it's time to do something with it, and you do something with it. Right. Okay. Um, all right. Oh, wait, I got one more thing before I move on to there. Um, so, this year, <clears throat> Um, F Sharp Deep Dives is a book that's, in, if you're familiar with Manning Press, it's a MEEP, right? So it's part of the early access program, and they're kind of modeling. And so the book's not published yet, but if you pay for the MEEP, you can get, you can review it as it's being written, essentially. So, so I took this from there, and um, they also like Thomas Petricek or Tomas Petricek, I don't know how to say his name, but it's Pet Patricek. Patricek. Tomas Patricek. Um, He's been working on this um, GitHub project called fsharp.formatting. And if you go to um, you know, this URL, he's got a really neat site on the, like, how to, you can create you know, HTML for Markdown. And he's got an HTML processor. And it's kind of like something like this. right? And you can see the entire code for the Markdown processor and all that kind of stuff. So if you want to see a real, a real world example of solving a problem, and it takes you know, discriminating unions and pattern matching, it's all in there. You can just look at it right there on the web page. It's pretty neat. Um, so the, here's a way where you can take a Markdown document. Is everybody familiar with Markdown? It's basically a text way to, uh, it's a particular pretty lightweight syntax for creating HTML. So like you could do star text star, and that means bold, right? And th those kinds of things, right? So, so basically, what this processor will do is it'll just take some text that's marked down and it will go through through it and parse it and generate HTML. Okay, and so this here is a type, and so this discriminated union and there's a little you see this and keyword which we didn't talk about, um, but basically this makes I mean just read through it it's going to make a lot of sense. So a marked down document is a list of marked down blocks. Okay, so what's a markdown block? This is why we need the and keyword, okay, because we haven't defined markdown block yet, right? So and, and the and keyword kind of helps the compiler figure out where these references are. You can think of it that way. So, so here's a markdown block. So we got a heading, which is a, some number of markdown spans, right? A paragraph, which is markdown spans, and a code block, which is a list of strings. Well, what's a markdown span? Well, that's just a list of markdown span. Well, what's a markdown span? Well, that could be a literal, it could be inline code, it could be you know, a strong type, bold type, or emphasis, or a hyperlink, right? So you can see, just by looking at these you know, 15 lines of code here, you can get a sense of, wow, I just modeled a markdown document right here, and it makes sense to anybody who doesn't even know F sharp, really, right? Now, I didn't do, I didn't create a C sharp version of this, but you can imagine, you know, having public class this, constructor that, you know, and 
to get any value out of what these things are. You're going to have to expose them as properties and, and all this kind of stuff. And it's going to be... Any idea how this would be expressed in BNF, block style format? I don't know. I wonder if it would be as expressive or <clears throat> equal or something. I'm not sure. Okay. So this is, I mean, this is a very powerful representation of something that, you know, clearly, you know, F sharp, I think, has an edge in creating an object hierarchy. You know, something that's pretty complicated, really, but does it quite simply. It's, it's, it's good for situations where, where if you're going to wind up having complicated and or long uh, trees or graphs of, of data, you know, deep hierarchies of data, um, and in particular, there's going to be a lot of recursiveness where, where you know, the same thing can be inside of itself multiple times. Um, you know, all that's very easy and natural to model with this kind of structure. And then it's using recursion, uh, in recursive functions, you can, you can walk through it and react, uh, you know, whenever you encounter an, uh, an object, uh, an item that, that contains other items, you just start with going through them recursively. Um, and this common um, uh, discriminant union means that every function that you write that deals with any of these things has to deal with all of them. Okay, so that you can always take any element from, from within there and pass it into that same function recursively and it'll know what to do because it's already got all the cases um, programmed into it. <coughs> And you end up with some pretty compact and concise code, right? But it uh, makes it easier to understand. Well, I don't know if it makes it easier to understand if you're coming from an old world. It might take you a little bit of time or effort to get through it. But once you get used to it, it it's really, I don't know. I guess it's like anything. Once you get used to it, it's easier, right? <laughs> but but you that's when you really can appreciate, you know, F sharp, I think, if you look at, okay, well, let's look at the processor and how this works. And then just thinking ahead, how would I do that in an object-oriented program? And then think about how would I extend it? How would I, you know, how would I maintain it to add features or anything like that? How would I test it? Right? Those kinds of things. All right. So next, I want to talk a little bit about correctness. Do you like my one-word slides? I do. Um, all right. So. Um, So when I, when, I, when I use the word correctness, I'm thinking of like accurately representing this thing in code, right? And then making sure that it's in a valid state, right? And that it has meaning to other programmers who are looking at our code, right? So take, you know, see this first definition here, type person. So email address a string. We've all, we've all seen that, right? We've all done it, right? Email address string, but I probably have a property that also says name string. All right, first name string, last name string, email address string, okay? Well, those are all strings, you know? The only thing that differentiates them is the name, right? Shouldn't I have stuff around actually saying what that thing is, right? What is that string? I mean, aren't there rules around a string? Like, what makes a valid email address, right? Can't just be ABC. Where's that validation code go? Who's in charge of it, right? I mean, all these kinds of things that you think about, right? So. Let's use, um, oh, yeah, definitely. You got to read this, right? So, I'm sorry, I totally missed this. F sharp for fun and profit, right? Go to that website. That guy's done a lot of awesome articles on F sharp. Um, and this is one of his series is called Designing with Types, okay? And that's where I pulled this out of, right? So, it's a whole, it's like seven or eight different articles, right? And this is just like, this spans a couple of them, but I just pulled bits and pieces out of it to make it a little clearer. All right, so he's got a lot of really, really good and, and accessible, like in a digestible you know, fashion. I mean, very clearly written. Um, so we're going to use what are called single case types, so or single case unions. I'm sorry. So we're going to use a discriminating union, but it's only going to have one case. All right. So this is a type email address equals email address of string. So it's just a discriminating union with one case. All right. And we're going to use that to represent our string email address instead of just a plain old string, all right? Now, what are the advantages to that, right? Um, so here's, 
maybe how I could do some validation. So I got a function to create email address, and we're going to pass in a string, right? And then I will just do a regex on it. And if that regex passes, then we're going to return, we're going to construct an email address, right? So that's just like our square five, right? So we're going to create an email address with that string, and we're going to return that. Otherwise, we're going to return none, all right? So sum and none is called the option type in F sharp. So that's built into the language, and it's sum of t generic or none. So basically, and some of the framework functions return this. So like, if you, I think if you do like a try find on a list, if you don't link, you know, like a try find, you might return null or maybe a, I don't know something. But what the F sharp sequence or list does is it'll return sum and then the, what it found, or it'll return none, meaning it didn't find it. So it's not going to return null or anything like that. It's actually going to return a type. And this is a very common thing. And, that, and the option type is just a discriminated union with two cases, sum and t and none. Right? So what's, what's interesting about this is if you create a function like this that returns sum or none, imagine your application where you're trying to validate an email address. You have to deal with return type. So this is very idiomatic uh, functional programming where I'm going to return some value. Right? I'm going to do some validation. And I'm going to return the result if it's there. Otherwise, I'm going to tell you that, hey, that didn't work. So what if we want a little more control? What if we want to say, hey, you know, just regular expression, you know, matching is one cause for failure, but maybe you're doing a login, and maybe that email already exists, right? So maybe there's a, a, more than one way that this thing could fail. So how could you do that? Well, we can create another uh, discriminating union. So you'll see discriminating unions ever in F sharp, right? So we're going to create some kind of creation result. We're going to have success of t or an error, right, of the string. So here's a second way to do it. Instead of passing the option type, we're going to say, all right, well, here's our thing, success. Or we're going to say, all right, no, it's an error. This isn't a valid email address. Okay? So we can bubble up the information. Now what if we we'll take that a step further and do uh, client control um, validation? So this is you know, functional programming, you end up with functions that take other functions, right? Mm -hmm. That's one of the beauties. So functions are, these are called higher order functions, a function that accepts a function as a parameter. 